the big event waited we're waiting for is the uh, Ukrainian counteroffensive. But I think we're seeing shaping operations potentially as part of that. I think the uh, incursion into Belgorod uh, was uh, a demonstration, a raid in order to put the Russians off balance. Uh, moving further south to uh, Bakhmut, of course, uh, the story of Bakhmut continues. And I think there's a, a lot of discussion still about whether, whether the Russians have fully secured it, whether the Ukrainians have got a toehold there or not. What really matters is not so much whose flag flies over Bakhmut, but the really strategic impact Bakhmut is likely, the battle for Bakhmut over the last um, several nine months or so has had on, the impact it's had on wasting down Russian assets and Russian capabilities. As yes. a Ukrainian minister said to a group of us the other day in Kiev, we have designed a very effective meat grinder in Bakhmut. And that is going to come, be played out when the uh, Ukrainians get more onto the offensive, I think. So just just on that, where do you read, where do you see the balance of advantage in this? When it comes to Bakhmut, it is a, it's a wreck of a city now, pretty much a, a shell. But so many lives, so much ordnance has been lost and expended on both sides. Russia has lost, well, tens, hundreds of thousands of, of armed personnel there. Ukraine have lost many people too, but from a smaller pool. How do you weigh the balance of advantage, Richard? I think the balance of advantage stays firmly with the Ukrainians. Yes, the Ukrainians have suffered heavy casualties there, and of course they're being pretty tight-lipped, rightly so, about the, the precise nature of those casualties. But the Russians have expended a huge amount of effort um, in and, and lost countless, countless Russian soldiers fighting for Bakhmut. Uh, and in doing so, they have uh, they've exhausted themselves. Their their so-called winter, early spring counteroffensive, uh, designed to recapture the eastern Donbass, Donetsk and Luhansk, has failed, and the Russians have effectively, in military terms, culminated, which means run out of puff. Yeah. Uh, and I think they're now set them. They've now they're now set up quite. Uh, the, the Ukrainians have now set themselves up quite effectively, if they're able to capitalize on that and. Um, and, and and attack but the ukrainians have got some challenges of course they have um you know and 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 we shouldn't assume that a ukrainian there'll be a single ukrainian counteroffensive which will deliver everything the ukrainians want to achieve i yes. think we should be thinking in terms of i mean it would be great if it did but the reality is it's unlikely to and i think we're yes. much more likely to see a series of counteroffensives all of which are going to need significant amounts of Western support, training, uh, equipment, logistics, ammunition, and all the paraphernalia of war to allow yes. the Ukrainians to achieve their objectives. Which I, which I want to come to. And it may be, as you say, the counteroffensive has in many ways already started. You refer to shaping operations. Just explain to uh, to the rest of us laymen what, what that is. It is about hitting weapons and fuel supplies, among other things. Well, it's about it's about it's about a combination of things. It's about it's about that, and that's that's what the military called striking into the deep battle to get your opponent off uh, off balance, uh, to hit his his infrastructure, his logistics, uh, his reserves. Uh, it's also about uh, ensuring that you match your strength against enemy weaknesses, and that of course requires surprise, and that probably means an element or a significant amount of deception. Yes, uh, so I think all these are are in the mix. Uh, and I think the the uh, the raid on Belgorod was a very interesting operation, small tactical operation, but that would have really surprised the Russians mm. and made them think, blimey, you know, we haven't got this covered. And that means they've got to move. You know, here is Mother Russia uh, being directly attacked by a group of, uh, of Russian anti-Putin movement uh, soldiers, and that will have caught the Russians off balance. Yes. And so that's exactly what you want to be doing uh, when you're getting onto the offensive, get your opponent off balance and then strike hard where he is weakest. It's worth pointing out, Richard, isn't it, that the the build up to the under the big the big event, the biggest event of the of the counteroffensive, if it can be described in that way, that's as important as a big military push. Because while we wait for that to go on, the leader of Ukraine, Volodymyr Zelensky, is, is around Europe talking to European leaders, traveling to parts of Europe, building up support and support in form in, in hard form of munitions and supplies when the when the big time comes absolutely critical because without that um without really significant western support ukraine won't be able to achieve its military objectives so so president zelensky's efforts to whip up and maintain that support is really important now a word also 
on this man, Evgeny Prigozhin, the, the leader of the Wagner private army. He is now speaking out in a really quite extraordinary way, publicly on, on social media, talking about withdrawing from Bakhmut and handing over to the Russian army, but also criticizing fiercely the Russian military leadership and the elites of, of Russia. What do you make of that? It's a very interesting story. I mean, I don't think you'd want to spend too much time with Prigozhin. He does not sound to be a particularly in, a particularly nice guy, but a couple of interesting points. I mean, firstly, the withdrawal of Wagner Group. Withdrawal in contact and by implication, therefore, a relief by the Russian army what's called in the military terms, a relief in, pl in place, is a highly difficult, complex operation. Um, and it leaves you open to all sorts of potentials. Um, so we'll wait and see that with interest. Um, to what extent has that been sanctioned by the Russian high command? Uh, and if it hasn't, of course, this is you know, lateral. And it demonstrates an extraordinary lack of unity of purpose, which I'm sure the Ukrainians will be able to exploit. Um, the second point, I guess, is, as you say, these extraordinary outbursts, um, effective, the insubordination and demonstrating the fact that Putin's not been able to shut him up demonstrates extraordinary weakness on Putin's part. I think the third thing I'd just draw out is the very interesting comment that Russia faces a revolution along, could face a revolution along the lines of 1917. Mm. Now, you know, there's some interesting historical parallels. Uh, the Russian army collapsed in 1917. Uh, and then that after the, the Kalinsky revolution of February, then the uh, the Russian army collapsed in, 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 in 1917. The Germans were able to to scoop up huge amounts of Russian territory. And that, of course, led to the Bolshevik revolution in, 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 uh, at the end of the year. The historical parallels are always a, a little bit risky, but 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 I think dictatorships are brittle mm. and armies of, of dictatorships are brittle. Uh, and if soldiers are being asked to fight in a cause which they don't believe in and suffer massive casualties, morale can be very brittle. So maybe Prigazin might be onto something. We'll wait and see.